Jake, do you have any do you have any objectives for next week on Katahdin? Uh, no, this is an annual annual trip with a, a bunch of friends. Actually, pad, mostly paddling friends. Um, we started it last year; was the first year, and want to have fun, hang out with some good people, each bring in good food, and if we get to ski some cool stuff, that's, that'll be great. If that storm comes in and we're, we spend two days hold up in the bunkhouse playing poker, that's going to be fun too. <laughs> so yeah. you guys have the, you have the chimney pond shelter rented yeah. out. We've got the bunkhouse. Yeah. The cabin. Nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. So you don't care if it rains. Right. <laughs> and one time, one day you're heading up. We're driving to Millinocket on Saturday and skinning to um, Roaring Brook uh, Sunday. Uh, yeah. We didn't get the chimney pond cabin Sunday, so we got to overnight at Roaring Brook, and then uh, we'll be in there till the thirty first. Come on, coming out the first. And you've got the little one with you. Yeah, the little one's gonna get a tour of his hometown of farm, other hometown of Farmington <laughs> with with Mama. Oh, uh, okay. I see. Yeah, not bad. Um, it's also some weird noise coming through. Are you catching that? Mm -mm. Yeah, I'm not hearing anything. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, so that sounds like a good trip. Too bad when you need to stretch out a little bit longer and get. Right. Oh, maybe we'll get some corn though. That'd be ideal. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Or we could have two feet of powder. Who knows? I know, really. Yeah, Sunday's, you, look, Sunday's looking like a toss-up. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask, Pat, if you've seen the weather. Um, it looks Originally, it looked like Valley forecast was going to have eight inches of snow, but that's since I think the temperature has risen on that storm as a whole. So I think maybe the higher summits are going to see some snow, but um, Valley's going to see, looks like it's the rain on tomorrow and and then or everywhere is going to see rain tomorrow but sunday looks looked like there was going to be yeah a little more of some, yeah so yeah i i the weather's been really strange lately the snow has been strange as well it's been hard to you know pre predicting spring skiing sometimes can be pretty easy and the last week for me it's been actually pretty challenging i've been like having these predictions and then being completely wrong yeah. um, when I'm up and when I'm up there. So yeah, it's been, it's been really tricky. How was, well, how it was your trip like with the kids? It's, it's still going actually right now. Um, yeah. But tomorrow's a rest day. We, we've done five days of skiing. So we had a couple really nice days in the ravine. Mm -hmm. um, Ski to Glade yesterday, ski from the summit today. Um, but it's just so weird because this time of year, you're usually like getting into that diurnal cycle melt freeze and now it's it just hasn't melt, frozen melt, melt. anywhere it's just melt <laughs> melt melt yeah so and but but some aspects of snow is staying kind of cold and um and some some aspects like there's wet snow on top but then a few inches down the snow is still cold and then there's like some funky crust layers underneath so it is it's really strange out there mm -hmm. yeah even up when we went from right uh left gully to gulf of slides we were running into those dry cold yeah. just pillows of snow randomly on the crust at yeah, and whatever at lunchtime you know yeah and the ambient air temperature is like you know 40 45 yeah. that's nuts so well we're creeping up on 705 so i'm gonna we got a bunch of people already here so welcome everybody thanks for showing up for our looks like our last um avalanche related uh, presentation tonight. Um, we, tonight we've got Jake Risch. He's uh, the president of the uh, Friends of Tuckerman Ravine. They just pulled off the 20th, right? This yep, is the 20th, 20th. anniversary yep. of the Inferno race last mm -hmm. weekend. So um, that's a pretty proud accomplishment to keep that rolling for that long. And it looks like they're gonna keep it going for next year too. Yep, for sure. Jake's gonna be, um, diving into risk management, talking a little bit about um, risk versus reward, and even talking a little bit about kind of more about the reward side and as well as balancing the risk side. So um, Jake has 
a lot of experience with international paddling expeditions and he's got a background with the army and a lot of the risk reward um, things that he'll talk about come from a little bit of that military background as well as uh, lots and lots of days up in the mountains on skis so i won't talk too much more um Jake, your slides up. And um, if anyone has questions, if you could put them in the Q&A box and then we'll grab those at the end and uh, Jake will um, answer those. If you put them in the chat, they kind of get lost in the flood of whatever else is going on in there. So appreciate your time for being here and um, thank you, Jake, take it away. All right, awesome, thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, so the, my talk tonight, you know, want to dive into a little bit of risk management and then a, a related um, topic of opportunity management um, and how they tie together to get into, um, you know, you hear people say, you know, is, you know, make sure that, that the reward is worth the risk you're taking. Well, how do you understand that? I'm going to give you a framework that I picked up um, through my various different ex experiences um, for quantifying that risk versus reward uh, conundrum. So just a little bit about me. Um, if you don't know me, I'm the president, like Joe said, I'm the president of Friends. Uh, I own a small, I'm a co-owner of a small uh, swift water rescue company. I do uh, consulting <laughs> for businesses, specifically helping companies that are bidding on government contracts, uh, put together bit, their bids. So I do writing and estimating and risk management consulting for them, uh, as well as other things. Um, I'm a swift water rescue instructor and a founding member of the White Mountain Swift Water Rescue Team. I've been a river guide. I've paddled on four continents, uh, expeditions on four continents. Uh, I'm exploring uh, first ascents around the world. Uh, I've been a project manager in Iraq and Afghanistan. I was an army officer uh, after graduating college for four years on an ROTC scholarship. And I've been a, a, a lifetime Mount Washington skier growing up chasing my dad around Mount Washington. So what is risk? If you break it all down, risk is a way to talk about uncertainty. Um, you know, you have, you go out and you have an objective and there's some percentage chance that you're not gonna have a good time or that something is gonna go wrong. And risk management and risk is a way to quantify it, the, you know, the, the likelihood that a problem is gonna happen. And then if that problem happens, what the consequences are. And it's a, easy way to sum up the, the potential for things going wrong, or, or as Blake said in his presentation a few weeks ago, you know, the potential for loss. Um, I got, I was introduced to risk uh, at an early age. I didn't really understand it in the, the framework that I've come to now, but my dad was always discussing and talking about not just taking risks, but taking calculated risks. And in my understanding as a kid growing up, that was, you know, checking to make sure that the pool was over your head before jumping off, um, you know, Big Eddie, the cliff at Big Eddie, or swimming around to make sure make sure there were no sticks, or um, making understanding that that there, he gave us an understanding that there, you know, there. It's okay to take risk and to have have fun and go after and, and do what uh, things other th people thought were risky, but you had to be careful about it. You had to be calculated about it and think through what could go wrong and 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 make sure that what you were doing was in fact safe in, in quotes. And so, uh, and I. Uh, when I got into the army after graduating college, I got I was introduced to a more structured framework to think about risk. So here in it, this slide shows how the army thinks about risks. You identify what the hazards are, 
you assess what the impact of the hazards are, develop controls or mitigation strategies, or make decisions to accept the risk. They then teach you to implement those controls, to supervise those controls and evaluate um, how they're working, and then go back and cycle back through. So if the, see how they're working, do you, the, the more hazards are the different mitigations you can make. And when I was in the army in the early nineties, it was a, it was a pretty big deal. We had to do a risk assessment for just about everything we had to do. Sending troops on a bus across to another training area. Let's do a risk assessment. Um, I was in transportation. So anytime we had to do transportation moves, we had to do a risk assessment, think about the snow, think the snow on the roads, road conditions, traffic, whatever it is, think through all the hazards. <clears throat> so in the army, we were taught this risk assessment matrix. And you'll, you'll look at this on the, on the left, you know, the vertical axis, you start to think through if something goes wrong or that hazard happens, what is the impact, you know, how, and that, how bad is it going to be if, if, if the thing that goes wrong goes wrong? You know, you rate that on a scale from not very bad all the way to catastrophic, you know. Um, I have to use a Band-Aid because I've scratched my arm to, um, it's, it's a fatal, fatal error. So you think, think through, for that hazard, if that hazard is realized, how bad is it going to be? That's on the, the vertical axis. And then across on the horizontal axis, how likely is that hazard to be realized? Is it, or is it frequent or like certain or all the way down to just an unlikely, it's a random thing that may happen, but it only happens one in a thousand times or one in a million times. You'll see this framework is very similar to how you know, we describe the avalanche problems. There's a probability, you know, for human trigger and you know, probability for natural, but also we talk about the destructive power and the size of the, of the avalanche. That's another way to talk about probability and severity. <clears throat> so this, uh, this risk assessment matrix is a handy to tool that allows you to think through, um, think through the risks and assign a risk assessment uh, for the, the hazard you're facing. And of course, being the army, there's a form for everything. And they gave us this form to, to think through the whole process. So it starts with identifying what the hazards are. In this case, they're talking about rain and cold. And you give that a, without any mitigation or any change, if you're just experiencing that hazard, what your initial risk level is gonna be. Um, this one happens to be for a tactical road march, which is another is a fancy word for a convoy or driving from point A to point B with a bunch of vehicles. So there's night operations and they assign that as a high risk um, because it might be snowing. They're looking at surface traction, the road width, potential for landmines um, and inexperienced personnel as the hazards they've identified. Then they go and they give that all an initial risk level. And then you start thinking about, okay, how am I gonna control that risk? What can I do to mitigate um, that hazard so, it, so we can make this exercise or this mission or this out, you know, day out in the mountains or the, our route safer. And you go through and you think through the mitigations, then you go back and reassess the risk with all your mitigations or control in place and you document that and, and so on and so forth. So if we take this framework and look at it on in the mountains, you know, you can identify some hazards. There's the hazard of avalanches. Right now, if it's, you know, early in the morning, you've got a hazard of long sliding falls. We're starting to get undermined snow, uh, hypothermia. There's all sorts of others. This list can go on and on. We go back to our assessment matrix and we say, well, if I'm going to go into avalanche terrain and I have no training, I don't have any gear, I haven't done anything to prep and I get caught in an avalanche, that could be that the severity is 
probably critical or pretty or catastrophic depending on the terrain you're on terrain you're in and you can go on the probability and depending on the the forecast and the and the work that that frank and the snow rangers have done you can get an understanding of the probability of that outcome and you can come away with a uh, a score in here and so if we go through this and say the initial risk is high or extreme for avalanche um long sliding falls you know we're gonna, we're thinking about it on the lip and so you slide down you're probably gonna the probability is a little bit is high if you don't have any any mitigation of gear um so we'll give that a high rating and then uh, we're this in this particular tour it's early in the season and really hasn't warmed up so the undermined snow may be a, a moderate risk without any controls and we think through how we're, how we're going to mitigate that risk so on the avalanche side to mitigate risk if we go back let me go back up here you can attack the problem two ways you can attack the probability, or you can attack the severity. So how can I attack the problem and make it less of a chance that I'm going to realize that hazard? On you know on the avalanche side, that's through you can go through terrain terrain management. Will and not ski in avalanche in slopes over you know 25 30 degrees. You really lower your probability score that way um, through understanding. Of this of the snowpack and and choosing the right aspect and elevation for the day, you can lower the probability of being in an avalanche. None of that lowers the severity if you get caught. On the severity side, things, the terrain management piece that would lower the severity would be understanding your runouts and not being above terrain traps, um, things like that. But also, you know, an airbag lowers your severity. It doesn't do anything for probability. Uh, a beacon lowers the severity because somebody can dig you out. It it doesn't do anything on the probability side. Uh, just for examples there. So we go through all of this, come with your mitigation. So for the avalanche problem, we're going to have good PPE. We're going to manage our terrain. Uh, we're going to read the avalanche report. We're going to get educated so we lower our, so we understand what the problem is for the day and work on the probability side. Long sliding falls, we're gonna bring our crampons and an, and an ax or a whippet to work on the probability side because that really lowers your probability of falling if you can if you have good traction to, to stay on the ice. And then to lower the severity on a long sliding fall day, you know, you wanna have first aid kit and rescue sleds so you can get person out or treat their injuries quickly so that those injuries don't uh, compound. Um, undermine snow, we're gonna, our mitigation and control for that today is just managing terrain and understanding where the, uh, where it's likely to be undermined and just avoiding those areas. Then we go back through with the mitigations in place, we go check our, our matrix and come up with a new score for each of these. And now, based on, on my mitigations now, I'm looking at a moderate moderate and low uh, risk assessment for, for my tour today. So that's, that's sort of, that's how the Army's risk assessment process works for uh, identifying and then managing risks. And I, now I don't, you know, I don't go formally have, fill out that form every day but it, I have this in the back of my mind. This is my construct that I'm thinking through is, okay, what is the hazard that I'm facing? You know, what is that initial risk? How can I attack and lower my probability of experiencing that risk? And then if I do experience that hazard, what are the things that I'm, I'm thinking about planning ahead for to make that hazard, the, the impact of that hazard lower? Um, so that in the end, oh, you reduce your overall risk um, for that outing or that um, trip or that day. So 
So the next question then, you know, we understand, understand the risks, but how do we know if it's worth it? So I, I, that process of risk management that I went through, that was drilled into us in the Army. Um, one thing I want to touch on before I move on, in the business world and, and the next step in, in project management and out, outside is then people will often start to assign um, value to that risk and how that works. Um, you'll say, you know, if the, if the worst outcome happens, how much is that going to cost to fix? And then you multiply the severity as in cost by the percentage. And that's how much money um, companies that try to set aside for risk is the, you know, if it's a 20% chance of a hundred thousand of a ten thousand dollar problem, then you set aside two thousand dollars in your budget. And so there's a budgeting aspect, and that's how the whole insurance industry is built. Uh, I had a mentor in the paddling world who you wouldn't have known it. He's a guy that um, pioneered most of the whitewater runs around New England, or was in the group that pioneered most of the whitewater runs, and. You would you, you, to anybody you're paddling with. He was just another paddler, um, very humble, and he was also a president in the Fidelity um, Network. Um, Boyce said that his understanding of risk from kayaking and being in the outdoor, you know, outdoor world was one of the keys to his success in the financial world. He just had a deeper, more under, deeper understanding of risk than most other people, and he was able to apply that in business to be successful. Um, anyway. So the question now is, how do we quantify whether or not the risk is worth it? Everybody talks, you, you hear it a lot, you know, do the risk justify the rewards? Are you, is it really worth it? Um, or, People, you finish a run and you're totally stoked. You know that was totally worth it. That 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 was that was awesome. But you never, you don't really think about what that means. Recently, through my consulting work, I had to write a section of a proposal that talked to, talked about risk management, and I was researching and I came across this manual. It's really boring. Risk Issue and Opportunity Management Guide for Defense Acquisition Programs. But what, what this introduced me introduced to me is the concept, this concept of risk issues and opportunity and how opportunities can be quantified and how you can think of think of opportunities in the same framework that you think of risk. So in this manual, they described risk management is what can, what possibly can go wrong and how do I manage for it? They define issues as something that's certain to go wrong. So in the context of the mountain, the avalanche problem is a risk problem. The open hole and the waterfall on the lip is an issue, it's a hazard. If you go in there, there's no probability it's a certain you're going to have a bad time if you ski into the the waterfall on the lip. Testing a slope, there's some probability that it's going to slide or it's not, and it's there's there's uncertainty. So risks have uncertainty, and issues are certain. Issues you can just manage and deal with. Uh, risks you have to think a little bit more about. Opportunities they ask what can be improved. And that all opportunities also fall on the uh, on a probability scale. So in this manual, they said you, you manage opportunities the same way you manage risk. So you, you can identify an opportunity in the mountains. If you're on a tour and you have a plan to ski left, but you get up into the gully and you're looking up at right and it's had more sun and it's the corn cycle is happening over there, there's an opportunity. Maybe we can 
go check that out. Do the same analysis, and I'll talk about that. And then and it follows the same process, but now you're looking at a, a probability that things are gonna be better on your new path and a scale, scale of how much better they're gonna be. So it would look something like this, right? Your probability is the same, unlikely through certain, but on the, the, the vertical axis, it's, and I made this up, this isn't from the army anymore, just the stoke level, right? Is it gonna suck or is it gonna be awesome? And you can start to think through that if it's unlikely that it's gonna be good, that's you know, not worth pursuing. But if you're certain to have a good time and certain that it's it's gonna be good snow and, and meet your goals, for whatever your goals are for the trip, then that opportunity is worth it. And there's a scale, you know, scale between all the way between that you can think of in it. So you, on the probability side, you start to think through if you're thinking, if you're in your trip planning mode, you're looking at opportunity, looking at all the different routes you could possibly take. And you start thinking, what is the likelihood that each either itinerary for the day is going to have good snow or good conditions or meet your objectives for for your outing and then if it's going to meet meet those how good is it going to be this sort of how to think through that and you know then if you've got an opportunity score and you've got a risk score you can start to work on the risk versus reward balance so, and everybody's got to do their own assessment on this because everybody has their own internal decisions on, on what, what is worth, worth it and how, how often, you know, where the, where you draw the line between staying home or, or going out and going up into the mountains. For me, you know, I might say if it's a going to be a poor bad day out and it's an extreme risk, I'm staying home. I'm probably not really going to get up into the mountains to poke around unless it's, you know, I might go up and try to find a, a safe or a, a safer place to ski and, and, and test, test my risk hypothesis. If I have a good chance of having great conditions on a, in, but a high risk, I would go up and with the intent of not, not going into terrain or not, not testing the risk, but going up just to see if my initial risk assessment was wrong. Um, if it's gonna be excellent conditions and low risk, that's like full on, let's go full send, get your buddies, get the GoPros out, whatever, get it all over social media. Um, but each person that has their own own rubric on this, on where they draw the line of um, going or staying home or going all out. But if you think through what are the risks for the day and how how risky is it to to go out on your adventure, and then what how what's the potential for having an excellent or a great day or a good day, you can start to quantify uh, and and think through that risk reward um, balance. Just want to next move into a little bit some other thinking I've I've done on risk and I don't have um, there's no studies or stats to back this up. This is just my own thinking over the years um, of of risk. Um, but when we make decisions, we're, we're making those decisions based on our perceived level of risk, how we feel the risk is, what with all the information we can gather, our judgment on how risky our decision, our, the, our activity, our action is gonna be. But when we go out and face the consequences and the consequences become real, they can become real based on the actual level of risk. 
we have a theory or a hypothesis of what it is, but there's an actual level that's out there. So if our perceived risk is lower than what the actual risk is, it's when you get into trouble. And that's when, you know, it's happened to all of us. Certainly I've been out and thought things were lower risk than they, than they are. And you find that's when you find yourself, you know, standing above the fracture line or you find yourself uh, triggering, triggering something or you find yourself and you just scratch your head and like, I missed it that day. So if your perceived risk is lower than your actual risk, that's you know, when you get into trouble. On the flip side, if the actual risk of what you're doing is lower or much lower than your perceived risk, you either have a safety margin or if the gap gets really wide, you're missing an opportunity um, for to achieve, achieve your goals. So through education, through um, time in the mountains, through mentorship, through um, experience, we're, the whole goal in the game is to try to close that gap between what your per the perception of the risk is and what that actual risk is. Another way that you can kind of get into trouble with this is that you take your initial risk and you do your, your risk mitigation, you think through all the controls you're gonna have and you overvalue the control that you put in place. So you, the classic example would be an airbag. I, if I have an airbag, I can ski anything, um, my risk is way lower. Or the motorcycle helmet where people wear a helmet, feel cozy and safe, and end up driving faster and taking more risk on their motorcycle because they have the helmet on. Not arguing against helmets, I think you need to wear a helmet on a motorcycle. You just shouldn't let it up your your risk to more than, than the actual mitigation that you're getting from it. So some other thoughts. So, and I've kind of sped through my slides. I apologize. We have our own, I'll leave you with this. We have our own personal ingrained level of risk. We're willing to accept to achieve our goals. Through education, mentorship, and time in the mountains, we can close the gap between perceived and actual risk and increase our understanding of the potential opportunities, increase our understanding of the potential opportunities and dial in our risk versus reward balance. This is my thought for today. And I know I've been pretty quick with the slides, but I'd like to open this up more and have a bit of conversation. So I'm happy to take questions and comments and um, think this through, so. Hey, Jake, I'll just jump in here and um, there's no questions typed in here, but if people do have questions or wanna open this up a little bit more, we can do the raise your hand and um, I can open the mic up and you can ask uh, mm -hmm. Jake questions directly and kind of be a little bit more of a conversation. But I've got one question here that just popped in. Um, perceived risk requires imagination. How did you develop your imagination about what could happen? That's a good one. I think I think the imagination of what could happen comes um, time in the mountains and, and seeing what happens to friends and, and colleagues is one. I think through with social media now and more of the um, incident reports getting out, you can. <clears throat> get um, an imagination of things that can go wrong. And then also through, you know, avalanche education, that's a big one for understanding what the, the what could, could go wrong. I think one thing that um, a lot of these talks mm -hmm. that we've gone through over the weeks here, there's kind of this sort of formulaic um, and I think that maybe that stems from some of the ARE courses or just kind of avalanche courses in general is it's a step-by-step -step process to get ready to go, you know, the planning, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But can you talk about some of the, you know, you used a good example of you're heading up left gully, but you realize left gully is a little too hard and right, uh, 
right gully looks a little more corned up and a little bit better. So you're not focused entirely on risk, but you're also looking at that opportunity of, hey, it's going to be a lot better in right gully than it is going to be scratching back down left gully. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about that, like dynamically throughout your, like a ski tour. Yeah. So that would be, you know, that example is a great one. So you're heading up left and it's in the shade and it's still boilerplate. And so your internal risk assessments in, I'm thinking the hazards, there's the long sliding fall hazard on the opportunity side, you know, my quality of my skiing is going way down. So the, 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 um, reward side of the equation is going down. This isn't going to be, I'm taking more risk for less reward going up left. If it's not, you know, it's not going to, the sun, sun isn't going to move shift by the time you get there. It's not going to warm by the time you get to the top. And then you're looking over at right gully and you're thinking, well, that's in the sun. My opportunity on the opportunity side, the skiing is going to be a lot better potentially. And there's a high probability because I can see it that my my um, guess is is right. And in that case, you're also the risk on the long sliding fall goes down because it's softer snow. So you're winning on both the opportunity side and on the risk side by lowering your risk and and increasing your chance of having a good day, and good turns. And how do you, uh, we've talked a lot about group dynamics and I think it's definitely worth uh, diving deeper into that, but, you know, let's say you're in a group of three or four or whatever, and, you know, someone's really motivated that they, you know, they came up here to ski left gully today, you know, talk about managing that on top of, of using that. I think, yeah, well, I think one thing that, that, situation opportunity really plays an important role because you're not just talking about the negative possibilities but you're talking about a definitive good better opportunity yeah i think one thing that that brings up is you know um making sure you understand what your objectives are for the day right and what if you're is the objective of the group to have good snow or is it to ski you know is it a tick list and you've got to finish your tick list each group and each everybody has their own uh, objectives and rewards um, that the, that they're after so having that conversation ahead of time to make sure everybody is on board with what the objectives are for the day what are the opportunities you're chasing um, would go a long way to then ad adjusting your plan to meet those objectives and, and find those opportunities that the group is looking for. Yeah. Um, if it was, you know, if, if you are in the case where you've skied every other line and this is your one chance to ski left, then maybe you go you attack the risk side and say, how can we mitigate and make let the, the run and left more, more uh, safer? Um, you know, what other, what other strategies can we just have a, longer lunch or can we ski right and then go over to left later in the day when it starts to soften and still still meet those objectives but change our plan to um, try to reduce the risk on the risk side uh okay we've got a bunch of questions here um this is from jules is risk management of the whole group a greater indication of actual risk as opposed to one individual will it Will a diversity of opinion close the gap between perceived versus actual? Hmm. Depends, I guess it all is on the, it depends. Depends on the, the how experienced and how much base knowledge the group, group like the overall group has, so it very well could. And it could also um, widen the gap as well if you have uh, sure. So I think that could go either way, depending on the group. But in general, more information and more thought, I think, would be better. Yeah, and then they also just added in there: should the group always default to more experienced single opinion of risk? No, no. Yeah. 
I think, yeah, people need to have space to be heard and and not get drugged into situations where they're not comfortable. Sure. This is from uh, Frank. He would he would join us on video, but he's got a little sketchy internet connection. Mm -hmm. um, how does the military community determine the real risk versus perceived risk in an after action review? No doubt intelligence gaps leave a fair amount of uncertainty on the table. Mm -hmm. Do leaders talk about that uncertainty when planning the next operation? Yeah, I think the after action review process that Frank talks about. So after every you know training exercise or the actual mission or whatever you're doing, the Army does a very detailed after action review where everybody gets to to speak about what went well, what went wrong, and what could be done better next time. And I think that process facilitates closing closing a gap because you have real feedback on, you know, uh, you did the risk assessment ahead of time, you you saw what happened, um, and now you can apply reality backwards to your thinking and see see how big your your gap big the gap was. And the next time, next time around, you have that experience, and you formally looked at looked at your decision making, so you can um, make it. You make more informed decisions the next time. Yeah, and that definitely seems like something that, especially if you're in a group of people, that's you know one week here, and then there's a different group next week, and a different group next week. But if you've got a solid group that you continually go out with, you can have those conversations at the parking lot. And, yeah. uh, and then the next time out, um, everyone's a little bit, maybe a little bit smarter. So we've got another question from Dominic. I've seen countless reports of highly experienced people getting caught and dying in avalanches. How does one as a newbie expect to ever gain any confidence when even people with decades of experience die? Hmm. That's a, that's a big one. Um, and I think you have to, it's more personal than that. And you have to, when you put, the, put time in and, and think about it, you just have, you have to do your best. And that's that first, the, the last slide, let me go back to it where, you know, maybe sometimes once we've had a lot of, um, education and a lot of time we may overestimate the impact of what we think there are controls and our mitigations that we're putting in place and so just trying to be as humble as possible when you're when you're thinking thinking through how you're mitigating the risk um, will help to uh, help with that experience gap and i'd be interested to hear you know Joe, Pat, or Frank, even if you have any thoughts, because um, that's, that's a big, heavy topic. On one yeah, of my, think, go ahead, Joe, sorry. No, I guess I was just gonna talk a little bit about what you are saying is, you know, when you're, um, when you're new into it, your goal should be much smaller and your, your mitigation should be much more robust and, you can eliminate or at least reduce a lot of those um, those gaps. And as you get more experience, then you adjust accordingly. And I think, you know, it's armchair quarterbacking here, but you know, experienced people dying in avalanches, that's a, a myriad of reasons why. But some of that goes back to just maybe a little bit of overconfidence, but also thinking that their mitigation plan is going to really work and maybe they're putting a little bit too much faith in that those mitigation steps whether that's you know whether they're going to be able to self-arrest with an ice axe on a super steep slope or you know whatever it may be but i think maybe that's where things creep into um pat yeah i was just going to add i think when you talk about somebody who's experienced who's getting killed or, or um, injured in an avalanche or any other mountain hazard, you know, that experience is equal to time in the mountains. And so when you have an increase of time, you also have an increase of exposure. Mm -hmm. So that is all weighing into the probability 
of these things happening. And it's exactly tied into what Jake's talking about. And so, you know, on an AMGA course or a guide training course um, recently, you know, one of the instructors was kind of running the numbers actually of, you know, the number of days a, a guide can spend. And I'm using a guide as, as an example because they might be somebody who's very experienced. He spends a lot of days in the mountains in, in different kinds of terrain um, that, that has consequence. And so, you know, in this, they were kind of going through the numbers about the probability of something happening to you over the course of your career. And it's shocking. Um, it's very high because of the amount of time that's spent um, with that exposure. And even if the risk is small on a certain day, over the course of your lifetime, that those, those probabilities are, 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 are very forefront. And, and mm -hmm. you, know, you, you have that exposure, even though on, a, on any given day, the risk might be very low, but over the course of, of somebody's career or life, the risk you know, might compound, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it's just like crossing, right? You cross a busy street a hundred times, you cross it a thousand times, the odds go up of getting hit. It's, yeah, it's just probability, right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, Jeff Lane has raised his hand. Let me see if I can work this here. Uh, hang on. All right. Jeff, I think you're unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question. Cool. Uh, hey, I actually don't have a question. I just have something to add to that last question. Yeah. I think I like Pat's Pat's reply. And uh, I think the original question was how do you gain confidence as somebody who's kind of new to it? And the piece that I would really add is to pay attention every single day that you're out there. The more you pay attention, even if the actual risk and your perceived risks are low, uh, you're going to really increase that experience base. And it's really going to uh, kind of settle deeply in you where when you start to see actual risk increase, you'll be able to uh, recognize it more readily. And uh, you'll have kind of practiced the ability to pay attention. I think a lot of the cases where experienced people getting caught in avalanches actually happens is when they stop paying attention they let their guard down momentarily and it's on the wrong day. Um, don't ask me how I know that. Um, but I think that, I think that it actually does happen in more cases than just uh, myself. So that's my two cents on that. Yeah, that's a great comment, Jeff. I think, I think that's certainly underrated um, advice that, you know, a lot of people just getting into it are, are sort of, maybe riding on the coattails of an, the experienced group leader or somebody else that's got more time in the mountains and um, they're kind of on maybe autopilot a little bit. So um, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, let's see. Can you think of a time that you got your risk analysis wrong and what was the results? Oh yeah. Lots of times. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, the one uh, one time, and you took a great photo of that crown line, Joe. Uh, we I was out skiing. Uh, we were headed out on uh, I forget when it, this is five or six years ago, maybe more. Um, went out with the objective to ski something in Huntington. There was new snow with wind loading, and then you know, turns out that it was at one of the typical stubborn wind slab problem days and we backed off based on the avalanche report backed off Huntington headed up to see what was going on in Tux got up and looked at the Bootspur Ridge and the Bootspur Ridge looked good so we we're going to try to ski Dutchess and started booting up um, Hillman's and it was stiff enough that I needed crampons and I had new ski boots and something was wrong with my crampons so it took a minute to fiddle with my crampons and my ski partner started digging around in the wind slab and found you know it was there's some concern underneath the steel hard slab that we were thinking about and as we were doing that two or a party of three um, college kids ski racer types passed us in the boot pack and then we we proceeded farther up hillman's because trying to top out hillman's to our object new objective was the the 
Duchess. And the, the steel hard slab started to soften and red flags started popping. And my, we had a quick power and decided we were going to bail off of Bootspur and head over and see what we could find in Tuckerman. And we were transitioning at the top of the pine tree when the uh, college kids started to ski the lower snowfield. We were going to traverse the lower snowfield and they triggered a really big um, lower snowfield wide slide. And luckily the kid um, skied out from under it. No one was caught, but that was, you know, after a full day of heading up and changing my plan and trying to reduce our risk based on new information and new conditions, still ended up finding myself 20 feet above one of the biggest crowns I've seen in the mountains. And, you know, that was, that was humbling for sure to, for that to happen. And um, yeah, I don't have a lot of lessons except for that. That's a spot where my risk, my, my perceived risk got way lower than the actual risk um, for the day. Hmm. Yeah, that was a close call for sure. Um, you got another question from Frederick. Your discussion argues for humility in relationship to the mountains. Does that get articulated enough? I think it's getting articulated more. Um, I think the message is getting out, but I think it could be. I, I think Frank's uh, actually adding into that answer, um, typing it right now, but yeah, it's right. It's humility as well as, you know, just healthy respect for what's going on out there that we just don't know. All right, well, I think that wraps up the questions. Uh, let me just check in chat. Um, Frank added a link uh, for anyone that's talking about the frequency of exposures uh, that Pat was talking about uh, in regards to experienced mountain um, people. And that link is in the chat if anybody wants to go grab that link and take a look at that paper. Um, one more question. What's the most effective way to voice your concerns to a group that is more risk positive than you are comfortable with without being a downer or experiencing or without being a downer to the group? I think just speaking that you're uncomfortable and want to have a discussion uh, and seek seek groups that that's okay if i think if you're in a group that doesn't make space or that puts pressure on you for saying i'm uncomfortable um then that might be a red flag on the group you're skiing with yeah for sure um I don't know. Someone's asking a question about. Yeah. I'm not exact, Chris. Uh, is that Chris? You can't read your name, Chris Wu, or Chris? Can you tell me exactly what groups you're referring to? I can't tell. Yeah, I don't know. We'll pass on that one. Not sure what he's saying. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, it's eight o'clock, and. Um, any other any other questions? Fire at Jake before we wrap it up. One more thought on that previous question. Just if you're in a group or in a in a position where you're the more experienced person in your group, I think it's really important that perceived leaders in that space make make it clear that they they want feedback and checking in with people as well to make it comfortable for people to express that they're you know, not feeling it or not feeling comfortable. Um, so there's, there's a, there's responsibility on both sides on the person who's not feeling that there are, the person who's feeling that the risk is getting ramping up too much for their um, tolerance. And also for the rest of the group to check in with, you know, the people that are kind of over in the corner and quiet and thinking um, to make sure that that conversation happens uh, and everybody's on the same page. Yeah, and that's not just like, hey, everyone okay? It's more like asking the question, 
individually to people and, and being proactive about it, whether you're the leader or someone else that, um, you know, is in the middle of the group or the new person. There's no reason why we all can't um, speak up and, and feel confident that it's going to be a group discussion and not just, you know, someone being bummed out because you're not willing to go huck the mm -hmm. cliff or whatever. So and I, I think that has definitely changed over the last few years, it's getting better and better. So mm -hmm. um, hopefully it continues that way. Um, I don't know, someone posted a link to a YouTube, not sure Chris Woods, what that YouTube channel is or whatever, but hopefully it's pertinent to this. Um, and all right, oh, Frank's got, uh, love the various analogs out there in the risk analysis and management world. Really great tools come from the cross pollination. I, I think that's, um, you know, a nod to, to pulling, you know, this kind of risk assessment from obviously the army's got tons and tons of experiences and information and data points to draw from. So um, we can all learn from that. And, and I'm sure there's other industries and other areas that we can all learn from. So appreciate you pulling that in Jake and uh, sharing some of your experiences on the risk versus reward. And um, Hope everyone enjoyed that. And from all of us at the Avalanche Education Foundation, the Avalanche Center, and friends of Tuckerman Ravine, thanks for, for showing yeah, up tonight. You. And um, yeah, we'll keep you posted if any other events pop up. I'm sure things will happen through the spring and um, again, ramp up in the fall. But thank you all for showing up. Thank you, Jake. All right, thanks.